there. Um, nevertheless, we're finding ways to help and to serve and to impact in a positive way, as I mentioned before. And we hope to do more in the future, depending on what the situation looks like and how it evolves. So we're getting Steve from Heal Palestine. He's the founder of Heal Palestine on the call right now. I think he's on the Zoom call. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Good, how are you guys? Good, good. I know, I know you squeezing us in and having us here right now. It's Capri and I've got Hassan Piker on with me. We wanted to, um, so you are the founder of Heal Palestine. We just wanted to ask you, who are you and uh, uh, what does your organization do? Uh, well, that's uh, <laughs> my name. So uh, I'm Steve Sosby. I founded PCRF over 30 years ago. Um, first started bringing injured kids from Palestine during the first intifada. Brought the first injured child from Gaza back in 1991 to Los Angeles. He was a triple amputee, 10 year old boy, and have um, been fortunate uh, to be able to serve Palestine in a way that's hopefully had a positive impact over the years. Although obviously the need is much greater than anything any one individual can do, I've uh, been able to get over 2,000 kids out over the past 30 years. And right now we uh, with Heal Palestine, I started Heal Palestine, left PCRF after 30 years of building that organization and started Heal Palestine on January 1st with some other friends. And um, we've been able to get uh, do a lot in a very short period of time. Uh, we have 12 injured children in the U.S. right now being treated. We just got two kids in yesterday um, from Gaza. And we, well, they were in Egypt, but they're obviously from uh, injured kids from Gaza. Mm -hmm. We have, um, we're, we are building a field hospital in Rafa, uh, Egypt, uh, Han Yunus, excuse me, Rafa Han Yunus border um, that will be serving 2,000 patients a day. It's nearly finished. Uh, that's over a $1 million project. I saw pictures we, of it. It was beautiful. Yeah, it's, we're excited about that, yeah. obviously. This time, it's um, it's a huge challenge. But we are doing a mental health program for traumatized patients and children on the ground in Gaza, group therapy and individual sessions, which is obviously a small um, uh, you know, contribution compared to the need. Everybody's traumatized in Gaza. We're running a kitchen, which is providing over 5,000 meals a day, roughly. Um, moving from Rafa to Deir Bala because the, our kitchen in West Rafa is now closer and closer to the fighting so we're unfortunately have to move that kitchen which we're doing this week and that's in partnership with world uh, central kitchen um and we're sending medical teams in when we're able to uh to provide treatment on the ground there and we'll be doing more of that in the future providing shelter uh for uh, people who are homeless or have been displaced um not homeless because their homes have been destroyed uh, but have been displaced whenever able with the supplies being limited and challenged to get them in and then we're running remote cl makeshift classrooms because uh, children obviously have been out of school since October. Uh, and once the um, the genocide's in the post-genocidal phase, um, we yeah. plan to uh, do a lot more work with mentorship and building a leadership generation in Gaza that can help rebuild the country and and um, and take on some of these very serious challenges that are going to exist for generations on the ground. There, we're a nonprofit. We're you know although we're new, I've been doing this for as I said over three decades and very honored. And it's a great privilege to be able to serve the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause. So um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and I wanted to ask a question. You said you started working uh, in the uh, during the first Intifada, right? Yeah. Um, That's correct. So throughout the course of the past couple of decades, um, especially after numerous uh, Benjamin Netanyahu re-elections, uh, I feel like we've seen the Israeli government go further and further right. What, what could you say um, about this last siege uh, that is different than your prior experiences with the prior sieges? Well, I think everybody knows that this is a much, much greater scale of destruction and brutality and murder and killing, which has taken place. We've never seen starvation in Gaza. We've seen, obviously, a siege since 2006 in Gaza, which, you know, people were suffering a lot from it. Children were killed many times under previous bombing campaigns. Um, you know, children were denied access for medical treatment as they are today um, over the many past couple of decades. Um, you know, the impact that the siege has had for generations there it cannot be overstated yeah, from a mental health perspective where children suffer from post-traumatic stress the impact on the economy the impact on every sector of palestinian life but what's happening today is genocide we've never seen a situation where people are being denied food children are st dying of starvation in the north in particular when there's trucks and trucks of food on the egyptian side of the border waiting waiting to feed them we've never seen the massive destruction of Palestinian society, 
where 90% of the people are displaced and their homes have been destroyed and their schools have been destroyed and their infrastructure and their social life has been destroyed. Um, that's never happened before. It's never, and in fact, this has never happened even in modern history where we've seen this kind of premeditated, calculated destruction of an entire society in real time on social yeah. media. Yeah. And everybody sees it and everybody's aware of it. And yet it continues every single day. And, you know, our government seems impotent, lacking the political will to have any impact on it. And humanitarian groups like ours are extremely frustrated because even if you have all, if you don't have access to the people who are in need of care and support, then your, the resources that you have mean nothing. We have several injured children, kids with their legs blown off, kids that are dying in Gaza right now that we have treatment arranged for them in the States. We can't get them out. We have, in addition to that, trucks of food waiting to get into Gaza that can feed people. And all the other organizations are just the same. Um, and unfortunately, uh, nobody seems to care on a governmental level um, to make any changes that are going to end this humanitarian crisis. And that's, those words aren't strong enough to describe what's happening on the ground there. Um, nevertheless, we're finding ways to help and to serve and to impact in a positive way, as I mentioned before. And we hope to do more in the future, depending on what the situation looks like and how it evolves. Yeah, this is in direct controversy with the Leach, uh, with the Leahy Law, specifically around the um, the limitation of humanitarian aid going into Gaza. This is a major point of contention that actually puts uh, American lethal aid to Israel in weapons packages. It's supposed to it's supposed to put it on hold as a consequence of Israel directly stopping uh, the humanitarian aid. There are some numbers that are going around. I wonder. Um, if you could elaborate on that a little bit more, like, because uh, uh, the, the Israeli mouthpieces on a regular basis will use uh, tonnage, like they'll talk about how many tons of food are coming in. I think that like the American Peer project was obviously an abject failure. Uh, it fell apart, literally, uh, and, and not a single uh, piece of aid, uh, if I'm not mistaken, went through that to uh, directly to Palestinian hands. Um, what do you... Uh, what do you say to uh, the people that, uh, especially on the Israeli side, are saying, like, no, uh, enough humanitarian aid is going in? I think whoever says that doesn't know what they're talking about. They're not involved in the relief efforts. They're not involved in what's actually happening on the ground. There. The reality is that there's starvation going on, that people are um, trying to live on less than even a thousand calories a day. Um, I know the people that I interact with, my friends, my staff, um, colleagues, doctors that I've worked with um, can describe very clearly on a day-to-day -day basis, not only the lack of food, the lack of anesthesia, the lack of pain medication, the lack of antibiotics, the lack of basic medications that can provide people life-saving care. If you have a heart condition, you're a diabetic, you're on dialysis, you have, cyst you have cancer and you need chemotherapy, those people don't get adequate care. I'm not talking about those who are being injured in the bombings. And we know every day there's over 100 Palestinians being killed. Sometimes that number reach, reaches two or 300 innocent civilians being killed every single day in Gaza. And double that with the number that are being injured through traumatic actions of bombings and homes being collapsed and so on. We're talking about people who just need basic medications. They're not getting it. So anybody who makes the claim that this isn't a humanitarian crisis doesn't know what they're talking about. And for some reason, they're trying to justify uh, a clear, clear, obvious act of collective punishment, which is in violation of international law, and which is affecting a population which is for over 40 percent children. Yeah. Um, so those are the main victims here. And that's anybody who's trying to justify that really um, uh, is in committing a moral sin against, I hope, their own conscience and certainly against the truth. Steve, the one question I want to ask you is, and it's a question we, we've spoke before, and the one question I asked you is getting aid to the ground. And, and you, had a, a, you had told me before that you have to be creative. Um, it, how, do, how do we get aid to the ground when Israel is just not letting aid in on the ground? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously becoming more and more challenging because, you know, up to two, up before the invasion of Rafah, the border crossing was at least the Egyptians had and the Palestinians had some control over it, not enough to justify or to make a significant dent in the crisis that was affecting the Palestinian population on the ground. But trucks were entering. Now it's extremely, extremely difficult to get any aid in 
because the border crossing has been taken over by the Israelis and the Egyptians don't recognize their sovereignty over it. So that border is closed. Mm -hmm. um, getting aid in is a huge, huge challenge. There is or we have been able to get some in the markets. And then there are some organizations like World Central Kitchen, which have been able to get food continuously coming in, albeit not at the extent or the level that needs to feed the population. But we're working with them. We run kitchens in which we provide the manpower and the um, infrastructure and they provide the supplies and we feed people that way. But it's far short of what's needed, obviously. We could do much more had there, if there was a more uh, open stream of supplies coming in. Um, being creative means that we are able to purchase from the local uh, market whenever possible. It means that, um, you know, running makeshift classrooms for children who are missing school since October. And, you know, this has a long term impact on the minds of these young uh, students who should be in first grade, should be in fifth grade, should be in high school, junior high. If we can get them back into some kind of learning environment um, and out of that idle time of just, you know, being in a constant state of fear and uh, trauma and anxiety, um, that can help. And we're able to do that. That doesn't require that many resources. It requires hiring teachers and creating makeshift classrooms through tents and other shelters. And we, that's what we've been doing. So you do have to be creative. And then getting injured kids out and identifying ways to get children treatment, those kids who are in Egypt that are uh, uh, sitting in hospitals and not getting any care, we're coming in and providing them the treatment by getting them uh, um, um, access to care outside. And the same with the mental health program. We're starting a new mental health program, uh, running a mental health program in Gaza, which we have that's been going on for a couple months now. Doesn't require a lot of resources. You just need to bring in the specialists who have the experience and then identify those patients that can get the best care possible and then put them into a system of treatment. The same in Egypt. So we're providing mental health uh, support for traumatized children coming out of uh, Gaza or have been coming out up until recently. Um, who have a significant trauma injuries, have lost family members. Uh, the 12 kids that we have in this country right now in the United States getting, getting treatment for free. The American hospitals are treating them without charge. Every single one of them has a family member that's been killed. Every single one of them has experienced firsthand significant psychological trauma and anxiety as a result of what they've gone through. And it's not just their own physical injuries of losing limbs, uh, su suffering severe burns, um, you know, head injuries, and so on all of the kind of medical conditions that we're treating, it's these kids for the rest of their lives have been scarred by the loss of a father, of brothers and sisters, of entire families. We have two boys in Boston, one's five and one's 12 brothers um, who survived a bombing of their home. Which their entire family was killed, their parents, their siblings. Um, and the 12 year old has severe burns and just learning to walk again and his brother lost his leg that's yeah. a life psychological injury and this is just two of thousands of kids in gaza tens of thousands who are traumatized for the rest of their lives se severely because of their physical injuries because of what happened to them and that number is actually much much higher than what anybody can estimate right now there's oh, nearly twenty thousand new orphans in gaza and there's over 30,000 children who've suffered significant trauma injuries. They're going to require multiple reconstructive operations for the rest of their lives. Um, and that our organization is committed to treating them for the rest of their lives as, as long as we can. And coming in not only to heal their bodies, but also to find a way to heal their minds and their spirits and their hearts. Because what's been happening isn't just a destruction of Gaza as a physical structure, as a society. It's a destruction of the mindset and of the psychology of the Gaza people, of the Palestinian people. Yeah. Steve, I know you got your limited time. Uh, we've, we're up to, we're raising money for you and uh, MAP and UNRWA, uh, for HEAL, MAP and UNRWA. Um, you know, not you, but the organization HEAL. Uh, we're at $1.3 million so far raised, which is fantastic. And we're, ho we're hoping to get to 1.5. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that we can, uh, I, I spoke to you last time and, and you were actually at the hospital with those kids. It was just impromptu. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I do, if you have anything uh, left to say, uh, let me know. Um, but I know that you are short on time right now. Okay, yeah, I think there's always one thing that we all have to say. And remember, all of us individually, is that we're responsible for what's happening. 
whether we're Americans or whatever your nationality is, everybody in the world's responsible, especially the Americans. Oh yeah. Uh, no. And therefore, we as Americans or as free men and women on this planet, walking on this planet, have a responsibility to stand to stand with those who are struggling for freedom, and struggling for justice and equality and sovereignty and self determination, as the Palestinians are and as they have for generations. And it's our responsibility to heal the wounds that are being inflicted by our governments uh, on these children, on these people. And I and that doesn't mean that you you know you should wake up every morning and see these images of of children who've lost their limbs or these parents who are carrying uh, you know pieces of their children into hospitals uh, in complete anguish and despair and that you just feel there's no role for you to to do something positive. No, we can and we must stand with the Palestinian people today in an effective way, in a way that isn't just scrolling and liking. You get out in the streets, you let people hear your voice, you carry the flag with pride, and you do something positive to heal their wounds. The people in Gaza need to know they're not alone. That while the world has watched this genocide, which has killed over 1% of their children through bombings of their schools, of their mosques, of their churches, of their homes, of their refugee camps, they feel that the world considers them as subhuman. And what our job is not only to heal these children, but to show the people there that we love them, we care for them. We're going to heal them and we're going to stand by them during this historic moment of genocide in which we are now going to have to be accountable one day to our children and grandchildren who are going to ask us, what did you do in 2023 and 2024 when children were being killed every single day by your government? What did you do to stop it? What did you do to stand up and say enough? If you can heal one child, if you can heal 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000, that's your responsibility and that's a great deed. So don't give up. Keep struggling. We're all in this together. Let's work as one unified collective body of Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, whatever. We're here for justice and freedom. That's a universal value and universal cause. That's what the Palestinian cause is about. And we have to keep working. We can't give up. They've not given up. We don't give up. So let's keep yeah. working together and find ways to show the world and to show the people in Gaza we stand with them and we'll never abandon them. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that was beautiful. I, pr I appreciate you. I mean, every time we talk, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Hassan, do you have anything else? No, I, yeah. mean, I don't know what else to say. It was <laughs> yeah. perfect. It was, I'm happy that Thank you uh, guys. we're able to work with you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. I'll we you. appreciate it. Thank, Thank you guys so much. God bless you. Hassan, I follow you a lot. You're a great voice. I appreciate all you guys speaking up and taking a stand right now. This is a historic moment and uh, we want to be on the right side of history. And we are. If you're with the Palestinian people for the, in their struggle for justice and freedom, you're on the right side of history. So thank you guys. Thanks, brothers. Let's keep struggling together. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate thank you. Your thank you. God bless you. God yeah. bless you. Take care. All right. That was pretty powerful. That was, that was really powerful.